Greetings, everyone. Welcome to all participants for today's panel's discussion with the title of Entrepreneurship in Tech, Getting Started. Today's discussion aims to provide participants with basic and fundamentals of entrepreneurship in technology and industry, along with advice and guidance based on their experience. My name is Sihan, and I will be your MC for today's discussion. Without wasting any more time, let us get right into it and introduce you our moderator of the day and the panel of industry experts that are willing to spend time discussing on entrepreneurship in tech. Our moderator for tonight's talk is none other than Ms. Padma Priya Anapurumpan as Sajan Rajan, which is a first year computer science student. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start off today's discussion, let us give a heartfelt welcome to our panelists for today's discussion. Our first panelist is Ms. Nolisa Francis Nodi. Ms. Lisa boasts over 20 years of experience spanning semiconductor, IT, blockchain, and business development across global markets, notably as CEO at Interlibware Solutions in Hub and Certified Solution M. Sandia Berhad. Let us bring in Ms. Lisa to introduce yourself. Ms. Lisa, the stage is yours. Hello everyone, thank you. I'm thrilled to be here as one of your panelists for your upcoming hackathon. Uh, yes, the name again is Lisa. I wear two hats, like mentioned. Uh, I'm the CEO of Intelligent Solutions as well as Certified Solutions. Uh, with a quick rundown, at Intelware, we do software development with a twist of specializing in blockchain use cases. Uh, whereas for Certify, we focus on certificate management solution, also on blockchain. And a little bit about me, like mentioned, I've been in industry for over 25 years across the globe, Japan, US, Singapore, and Malaysia, five years in blockchain. Uh, like everyone of you, I'm also, uh, you know, uh, went through my bachelor, master's, and also now doing my PhD. So I diversified a little bit from electrical electronic, going for mechanical, and right now doing my PhD. Um, well, industry side, 15 years in semiconductor. This is Penang, you must know well about semiconductor. And then five years in R&D, and I have a net for navigation in business operation, compliance, as well as system development. Uh, here's for the kicker, I'm always learning. Right, uh, whether it's about market access, sales strategy, as the latest tech trends, and so I'm all ears. So, buckle up, folks. I'm going to be your, um, together with you, with your right on your hackathon. Good luck. Thank you, Mr. Li Thank you, Miss Lisa. Next, let us introduce our second panelist. Mr. Tong Jae Shon. Mr. George, Mr. Jae Shon is the head of talent and innovation at Credit Super, combines expertise in family owned enterprises and multinational cooperation. Mr. Jae Shon, feel free to introduce yourself to our audience. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jae Shon. So, uh, my background is more towards um, family owned businesses in my past experiences. I've joined uh, intellectual property uh, company from the US, uh, Clarit, that's also based in Japan, before joining Cradle Fund. Um, so, my background, I dwelled uh, within communications um, in the US. I was in the US for seven years before I came back to Malaysia pre COVID. Uh, then I went back to the US to get my master's. Uh, so basically spent half of my life in the US before coming back to Malaysia. Uh, it was interesting times uh, right before COVID, uh, diving into MNCs and then moving to uh, GLC. Uh, all different experiences, all very valuable. So I hope uh, joining in this uh, panel, I'll be able to share my experiences throughout my years and provide insights that um, the audiences may want to learn from and share. So thank you for the opportunity to let me join. Uh, very happy to be here today. 
Thank you, Mr. Jay Sean. Last but not least, let us introduce our third panelist, Mr. Muhammad Adrian Wong. Mr. Adrian is a seasoned senior business development manager at Thundersoft with over two decades of experience as a technopreneur in ICT. Mr. Adrian, feel free to introduce yourself to our audience. Hi, Assalamualaikum. Uh, very good afternoon, everyone. Um, hello, fellow panelists, uh, Lisa and Jason. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Adrian. Um, I've been in content creation, uh, games development, software development, and e-commerce and logistics. Uh, I've been an entrepreneur all my life. Um, I've been um, handling a few startups of my own. Um, currently, I'm working for a company. Um, we have about 150 um, engineers that are doing software for the likes of Intel and Semiconductor. Um, currently, I'm also um, participating in a lot of hackathons, but this time around, it's more on the mentoring and judging and giving back. Um, Alhamdulillah, I've been uh, a beneficiary to many of the government grants, especially from uh, Cradle, MDAC, and, and Cyberview. So um, if there's anything on the entrepreneurship space, um, there's been a lot of ups and downs from my side. Um, I also do a lot of NGO stuff. So I, I, I contribute to two NGOs, uh, namely the Malaysian Scientific Association and, and War on Cancer. I also do a lot of uh, sustainable, sustainability projects uh, for events on a global scale, as well as uh, I was part of the uh, facial initiative during COVID-19. Um, looking forward to contributing to the panel and answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Adrian. From the brief introduction, we see that today's speakers are not only expert in their field, but it's also experience based on the role they hold. I'm certain that all of you are eagerly awaiting to delve into today's discussion. Without delay, let us continue to give a generous welcome as we kick off today's discussion. The stage is now yours. Hello, everyone, and a very good day. I am Padma, your moderator for today's session. I'm excited to see and hear what our experts have in store for us today. So, without further ado, let's welcome our panelists to the stage to start our discussion today. Now, Let's kick off our sharing session with the first question. What are some of the biggest challenges someone will face when getting started in entrepreneurship? Ms. Lisa, what are some of the challenges that have you faced? Thank you so much. Okay, that's interesting. Um, number one, uh, of course, being an entrepreneur can be both thrilling and daunting. Uh, First will be definitely securing the funding. And then next will be racing against time to enter the market ahead of competitors. And uh, nonetheless, while doing all that, retaining manpower is another top hurdle, right? Um, so another thing that uh, you want to, I would like to also share with you is the vulnerability of sharing ideas during pitches can also lead risk to uh, the, the ideas being stolen. So sometimes even by investors who may turn into competitors. So additionally, the absence of regular salary also will, uh, you know, strain your personal finances. So these are among the things, so leading to possibility of loss saving. These are all the, the, the challenges that everybody will face. And that's all from my side. All right. Yeah, sure. Time retaining manpower is definitely one of them. And of course, sharing ideas because um, startups, right? We need a lot, a lot of new ideas. And then salary is also, um, I've heard from even from uh, other people that starting a startup is definitely like that. Thank you for the, in the uh, for the valuable insights. So what about Mr. Jay Sean? What are the challenges that have you encountered while getting started in entrepreneurship? Well, um, through the super roadmap, which is the acronym of the Malaysian Startup System Roadmap 2021-2030 by MOSTI. Um, we've actually identified the most common pain points, I think uh, Lisa also highlighted, which is uh, funding, 
definitely uh, will be the number one priority for startups. Then there will be also talent, which is trying to get the right talent to build your team members within your startup. And also innovation, which is to foster R&D, um, to develop new ideas can be very challenging. And especially we don't see a lot of um, Malaysian businesses that delve into the R&D space because R&D can become very expensive towards the end. Um, there's also policy and regulations where startups that are new to entrepreneurship uh, coming into the ecosystem can become very overwhelming because navigating within the regu regulatory environment can be very complex and time consuming. And lastly, market environment. For this market access, you know, uh, penetrating into different markets can be very challenging and time consuming. Uh, learning about the local ecosystem of each place, just moving uh, from Penang to KL can be a different, uh, you need different ideas, you know, look for different talents. And because even within the local space itself, nonetheless, if you're talking about international breaking through Indonesian market, uh, Singapore market, you know, there'll be a lot of different challenges that needs to be identified before going to the Thank you for chiming in. I've heard a lot of balance, right? Balance of, to build a new team. That's very, very important. You need to work together in order to make this start out really, really good. You know, so thank you for chiming in. Let's move on to Mr. Idris. What are some challenges that you have faced? Um, so I echo uh, the other two panelists um, in terms of uh, finding manpower and, and regulatory and competition. Um, but having been having been starting a couple of startups, I think um, I, I've been always starting startups with zero cash, um, and I've always been bootstrapping on my own uh, with fellow members with a similar uh, interests. Um, I guess the biggest challenges when you start off is always um, always funding and always the runway. Lah. So the runway is always how much money you have to maintain X amount of people to build an MVP. Um, and, and, and the MVP is always something that a lot of, um, either grants or, or, or seed money or your parents money that you're going to spend, um, that needs to take you to the next level. And so, um, I'm, a am a so, so there's a, there's a term where they call uh, unicorn and, and unicroach and, and Malaysians have the tendency of calling ourselves cockroaches or, or for the matter, Asians have the tendency of calling ourselves unicroach where. We are half unicorn, half cockroaches, um, and if you realize, um, cockroaches have been have, have been living since the dinosaur ages, and have been has been um, alive since the dinosaur ages. And so, um, I, I like to start a lot of my ventures uh, from hackathons like this, uh, getting validated, winning hackathons, and then uh, moving on to the next stage, which is um, either going to 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 grants like Cradle, um, where the they do very early stage in terms of uh, seed and and basically validating your idea from a hackathon win. And so, um, my my suggestion or, or for the matter um, to face the the challenges in in this is to join hackathons, which is free. Uh, get your your first seed money, whether it's five thousand or fifteen thousand, and then use that money wisely. Uh, don't go out buying a EV or a car. Um, try to stretch the money as long as you can on the runway and 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 pay like you know four hundred ringgit like internship fee or something like that and then try to build your MVP after that and from then on uh, start looking at you know your first customer and and so that's the biggest challenge for me um, always finding the first customer and always uh, finding the first customer that pays you and your first customer isn't your father or your mother or your brother or sister it has to be someone that you don't know. That is willing to pay and, and put the money where it's worth in terms of what your product or, or your services is. So that's that's basically uh, my take on it. Now. Thank you, Mr. Adrian, for the hits out on money. And of course, thank you for the um, idea of like taking ideas from other hackathons. Thank you so much. By recognizing these challenges, we can better prepare ourselves for the journey ahead and work towards building resilient and successful ventures in the ever-evolving tech ecosystem. 
Now that we have gotten a glimpse of the reality of starting entrepreneurship in tech, let's move on to the next question. From your perspective, what are the key trends shaping the technology industry today? Mr. Jaysha, would you like to answer the question first? Yeah, sure. So key trends, I think, in the recent years, uh, one to two years, we've been hearing a lot about uh, AI and ML machine learning. So AI, you've got the uh, ChatGPT, uh, Gemini AI, you know, everyone's delving into AI space. That's one of the things. Uh, IoT, Internet of Things, uh, which is also a vast network of interconnected things leading to new opportunities within uh, automation data collection and innovation as well. Uh, cybersecurity is another one of the big things uh, that we've been actually hearing for many, many years and also waiting for the next breakthrough within cybersecurity because right now uh, data privacy is one of the key items that's been highlighting by a lot of, uh, not only in Malaysia, but also other countries. Uh, because of all of these things coming in as well with AI, IoT, cybersecurity, the other focus is also uh, ethical technology, which falls within uh, ESG, so sustainability things. Uh, because when it comes to, for example, AI algorithms, that it's currently discussed globally that misinformation on social media, especially. So there's a hard push actually on ethical development and the use of technology right now. Uh, let's not also forget the current trends that Malaysia is actually strong in uh, agri-tech, food security, which uh, the government is also pushing very highly. So those are the current trends that I foresee coming within this one or two years. And things may change very fast again. Uh, for example, the news on ChatGPT when they announced their recent announcement on how they developed their algorithm to push uh, pictures into videos. So that was not uh, foreseen, especially uh, within for anywhere from within a year or two from now. But they made that announcement uh, way ahead of time and they actually developed it. So things usually takes time for one or two years right now, and now within months, you can see new developments already. Things are changing very fast. Thank you, Mr. Jason. I heard AI, machine learning, chat GPT is also something that I always, always use because the studies, you know. <laughs> so thank you for the answer. Let's move on to Mr. Adrian. Would you like to elaborate more on this? Yeah, so... Um... Um, Jason is right in terms of uh, the the themes or the key trends that it, I mean AI is definitely the new buzzword for the last year. It's going to be for the next five years to twenty years to come. Um, I'll leave the blockchain and crypto and search to Lisa, um, but um, I think agri tech and um, sustainability in terms of ESG, five uh, G, and then um, autonomous. I think we're going to see a lot of uh, meshes in terms of um, AI and 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 humanoid robotics and stuff. Um, there's the there's a number which is I think thirty five percent of increase of uh, humanoid startups in the states lately, um, and we're seeing a lot of mesh up in terms of AI and and humanoids, and you know everybody's you know either calling it doom or gloom, um, but there's a lot of things in terms of health tech as well. I think. Um, the industry in Malaysia is is moving towards um, health and uh, agri tech. Um, I think there was an article. I think there's 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 two hundred fifty million out there. Uh, it's uh, EPF money. Um, it's it's been managed by Gobi Partners, and um, they have a few um, um, trusts that they're looking at in terms of teams. Uh, so namely, um, healthcare, agriculture. Uh, financial services, sustainability, and social infrastructure, as well as education. So these are some of the things that um, where a lot of uh, VCs or, or investors are putting money in. And so the trends are normally where the money is. 
Um, I'm not sure whether a lot of people will agree that uh, crypto is, is here and gone um, and whether the metaverse is also here and gone. Uh, but there's a lot of hype still after uh, Apple's release for the Vision Pro. So um, I think looking on the on a local scale, on a global scale, I think uh, a lot of trends tend to, to follow a global scale on it. And so um, there are a lot of hackathons uh, around the AI space currently. Um, Agritech is always here to stay in terms of drones and whatever not. Uh, yeah, so that's basically um, the key trends for the tech industry for today. Thank you, Mr. Adrian, for sharing your perspective. I heard AI and robotics, that is also some of the many topics that I've heard um, during like hackathons and things like that. So let's move on to Ms. Lisa. What are your thoughts on the key trends of shaping the te technology industry? Uh, unfortunately, Ms. Lisa, I can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, thank you. Yes. I, I also echo both uh, Mr. Jason and also Adrian. Um, yeah, from my perspective too, the several key trends are shaping the technology industry today. First of all, there will be the focus on sustainability, uh, ethical tech practices. So um, all this driven by growing awareness of uh, environmental, social impact, and of course, um, again, just like the, the gentleman, the rapid advancement of AI and machine learning uh, is revolutionizing um, across uh, healthcare and also finance, finance sectors. So for blockchain, the pervasive adoption of blockchain technology is enhancing the security and transparency across industries. I do agree with uh, Mr. Uh, Adrian on uh, the metaverse and the ICOs, cryptocurrencies. It's, it's, at, at this point, it's still a hype. Uh, so my focus will be more on security and transparency across industries as far as blockchain uh, adoption is concerned. Right. Th thank you, Ms. Lisa. And so, I think it's my data. I, I think that's okay. So overall, the trend highlights the importance of prioritizing the innovation with science and showing the technology serve humanity while addressing global challenges. So this is the core thing, always address humanity. Back to you. All right, thank you, Ms. Lisa, for your response. Thank you again to all panelists for sharing their, your expertise and perspective while contributing to our understanding of the evolving tech industry. Let's proceed to the next question. Can you share some examples of successful tech startups that you know? Let's start off with Mr. Adrian. Are there any successful startups that you would like to share to our participants today? This question is actually very sensitive. Um, um, reason being is because um, there, there is no um, gauge in terms of success. Um, a, a lot of startups are uh, sad to say burning a lot of money. Um, and if you look at monetary in terms of um, most of the startups, um, even even the big boys like Uber and stuff in the States, they're not exactly making uh, profit in terms of, I mean, they're making revenue, they're making fantastic revenue, they have fantastic growth. But if you look in terms of monetary, there's a lot of startups that are successful, um, but in different ways. So um, if you take the the most homegrown startup, which is Grab or, or My Taxi in 2012, um, and if you look in the perspective of creating jobs and pushing the gig economy and, and bringing food and, and, and going into a stranger's car in year 2020, then that success in terms of being a social company and bringing greater good to the economy of Malaysia. Um, there are a few other uh, unicorns like Qasem, uh, Faith, you know, and then there's some exits from a lot of VCs like Sage that sold off to Media Prima and stuff like that. So if you look in terms of monetary, um, there, there are startups that are uh, very uh, heavy on revenue and growth. Uh, if, if that's your 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 gauge for so successful. Um, and and there's also the sustainability part where if you know you create jobs and 
you create income for the rest of the population in Malaysia, then that's success to me. Um, but I think if you ask me um, success in, in terms of an overall, I think um, the fintech space in terms of uh, e-wallets and uh, financial inclusion and the fact that a lot of, um, you know, I, again, uh, there's a definition of startups again, uh, because Asia calls themselves a startup and is listed on Maranti's website as well. So um, if you're looking at, you know, say early stage startups in terms of, let's say one to five years or to, to 10 years, um, you're looking at the, the fintech space, even though with the big boys um, and, and the smaller boys in terms of payment gateways, you're looking at a lot of inclusiveness in terms of uh, digital banks today. Um, you know, Grab has a digital bank, Aeon has a digital bank. So I think um, accessibility to me in terms of uh, what Lisa said in terms of humanity as well uh, is something that we have to look at in terms of the, the whole wholesome uh, startup ecosystem and actually using tech to benefit that space. And so um, as, as far as, as payment is concerned, um, I don't even take cash out every day. Um, in fact, my wallets are always empty uh, and I'm, I'm so reliant on the e-wallets and, and the cash. So I think kudos to the, the fintech and and so the the one fintech that is doing very well well um a lot of people don't know is actually soft space uh soft space has been has been um quite adamant in terms of payment uh they started during the uh, square spaces where credit cards and uh, payment gateway i think they've they've moved on to a lot of um crypto stuff as well and also grab was also accepting crypto at, at, at singapore as well so the finance space is something that i, I feel that is is quite successful because Bank Negara and a lot of regulatory, like uh, uh, Jay Sean has mentioned, has has given licenses and actually pushed that space. So I think the whole ecosystem, in a sense, needs not just the the private sector, the startups, the VCs, but the, also the government uh, to play a role. Yeah. So that's my take on that. All right. Thank you, Mr. Adrian, for the many examples that you gave. Let's move on to Ms. Lisa. Are there any other tech startups that you would like to share? Oh, thank you. Um, absolutely, you're right. Uh, when it comes to successful tech startups, there are a few, of course, immediately that come to mind. First of, uh, firstly, uh, there's Run Cloud, founded by UTM alumni, which has seen which has seen remarkable growth from local player to global phenomenon. Their journey is truly inspiring. Uh, then there's Pentas.io, focusing on NFTs, enabling artists to monetize their work digitally. And the impact they have on people's lives are nothing short of incredible. So uh, I, I completely uh, respect what Pentas.io has done. And um, But if I had to pick one that I truly admire, um, it would be Corozel from Singapore. Being a unicorn, they have kept, uh, they have um, shown uh, their approach to embrace diverse cultures and implementing personalized strategies to penetrate markets. So I had the opportunity to uh, have a chat with them. Um, it's so interesting how, how, uh, how they had to do a lot of things uh, on the ground before they can enter Malaysia because Malaysia and Singapore, despite being just side by side, is completely different uh, in terms of um, how the market uh, reacts or the, the, how, how the, market, the, the, the appetite and how they recruit their, their seller and how to get in their buyers and so on. So all these are so interesting to me, the way they are doing it, so humble so humble yet uh, so effective. I learned a lot from them. So their, their story resonates deeply with me, showcasing the power of innovation and inclusivity of tech startup landscape. So that's, that's how I see successful from the eye of people, how they run things. I think I'd All like right. to echo uh, Lisa in terms of RunCloud as well. Um, we've, we've done some content for RunCloud as well. Uh, we've been following Arif since the very early days. Uh, Lisa, UTM alumni juga ke? Yes, yes. <laughs> I see. <laughs> I did my master's there. <laughs> ah, I see. Okay. So, yeah, Arif and, and his team, Ami, has been um, has been a 
a quite a Malaysian champion um, when they were at Tech Crunch. I think they took a very big leap of faith in terms of doing that. Um, and so some of the blog articles on Running Cloud actually uh, uh, by me and my wife, actually. Yeah. Cool. Sorry. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lisa and Mr. Adrian for responding. Last but not least, let's pass the question to Mr. Jay Sean. Can you share some examples of successful tech startups you know? Yeah, thank you, uh, Adrian and Lisa, for sharing those uh, startups. Those are already very successful startups. Uh, maybe I'll just take a step back a little bit. Like uh, Adrian said that successful for tech startup is actually very hard to measure. It depends on where you to measure them. Uh, but from my perspective, maybe I'll highlight uh, startups that are very local and seem to have a great story um, that are pushing to exit also. Uh, for example, we have uh, one involve Asia that there's a fit, I think. Uh, a lot of people are not so sure. You know, yeah, I mean, like now you do see on social media, you know, go into affiliate marketing uh, on TikTok, on Instagram, and on Facebook. But uh, Involve Asia, there's the back end part of it. So those partnerships are being formed, the payout, the revenues, content creators are being paid uh, through this back end process of how uh, Involve Asia is doing it. And another example will be a E and E sector startup. Uh, let me give an example. Phil Park from Connect. Uh, I think it's with the US and Trip know them as well. Uh, they were introduced to Cradle via Crest. Uh, they are a RF turnkey solution provider. So they uh, created a, their own AI, Iora. Uh, very interesting startup. Uh, they recently uh, garnered some funding as well from uh, government agencies. They do have an extremely uh, well thought of business model. Uh, this is one very, we do see very high potential in this startup as well. Uh, so it goes to uh, involve Asia. And lastly, I will highlight one very early stage startup. Uh, um, this might be known to a lot of people. Student recently graduated, uh, won the World Cup. Uh, World Cup Asia set up one of the events, uh, Aphelia. So they uh, are actually doing uh, space technology. This The founders do not have any uh, background within uh, space. Uh, well, I think one of them has a uh, engineering background only, but they delve into the space technology and they are actually creating a charging stations in space. So very interesting startup, very interesting background, very interesting stories they, they shared on how they uh, drop into the ecosystem. So these are the startups that I've been talking to a lot, getting to know them, uh, building their stories. Uh, so yeah, I think that's all for me. Hey, thank you, Mr. Jishon, for the interesting uh, examples of start startups. Insp it, it, is, it is inspiring to see a plethora of successful tech startups out there. I'm hopeful that many of us here today will chart our paths to success in the near future. Let's continue with our discussion. What are strategies that can be used to validate tech startups' ideas before fully committing to them? Let's start with Mr. Jay Sean. What are some strategies that you usually use to validate tech startup ideas? Well, I think. Uh... For me, it's actually talk to people a lot, you know, start with your own network. If you're still a student, you know, you don't have a lot of uh, white networks yet. Uh, start with your friends, family, colleagues, uh, professors, you know, teachers, mentors. Those are your current networks right now. Um, get the feedback and gauge the initial reactions because those First impressions actually brings up a, a lot of feedback to you. Um, do as Mr. Adrian also previously mentioned in one of the questions, whereby your first customer, 
you know, aside from your friends and family, that real feedback from a person that's going to pay for your product. You know, those feedbacks are very, very important. Uh, find a way to address them, uh, uncover the roots, you know, the whys, the whens, the hows, all these questions answered. Um, and always leverage on market research and competitive analysis. You know, they, there are some uh, market research reports that may cost a lot, but there are also free ones out there uh, that may be backdated a little bit. But leverage on those free reports, uh, understand what is out there already, what needs to be addressed, what can be addressed, what are the gaps within those reports. Uh, those are also very uh, good indicators, initial indicators where you can start from. Um, else can I talk about? I would just say I think MVP, different touch on the MVP. Yeah, uh, building a minimal viable product. Uh, I would suggest uh, when you're starting off, really, really focus on the core functionality of the MVP. I know, I understand that you get uh, to bring in your creative side, you know, you want to try this, you want to try that, but really understand the gaps that they're trying to fill first. Uh, those core functionality needs to be addressing the problem that you're trying to solve. So once you get the core functionality right, then you can slowly extend up. I think that's how I think of it. Be, uh, my other families has uh, better ideas because you know, they've been uh, building with their own startups. They may have more ideas with them. All right. Thank you, Mr. Jason, for the for sharing the strategies. What about you, Mr. Lisa? What are the other strategies that you use? Uh, thank you. So, of course, validating such startup ideas is crucial before diving in head first. So firstly, access scalability. To me, number one is scalability. If the thing is not scalable, stop right away. So access scalability by ensuring all necessary resources are obtainable and capable in handling potential traffic surges, as in like the users. And then second is evaluate technical infrastructure readiness. So ensure that the infrastructure is there, especially when talking about blockchain. In early days, 2018, when we first started, uh, the technology is of course good. The use cases are like endless, but the infrastructure is not there yet. So we are talking about not only public chain, we are talking about private chain and then data policies for government and so on. So that technical infrastructure readiness is important. And of course, next is the market appetite, aligning the product with cultural preferences and thirdly confirm the product market fit with rigorous testing and feedback loop. So this process is actually the one that took us about close to four years before we really embark. So we have to go through a lot of feedback loop to see whether there's really product market fit. And uh, finally, don't overlook soft skill. So this is another thing quite interesting when talking to technical people. They are so excited about the technology, but they forget one very important thing when, when you want to run business, which is um, can the team handle uh, the customers? Can the team handle the close sales? I'm not talking about other people, I'm talking about myself. <laughs> so, well, I think that I can build, you know, rockets and so, but I cannot sell one. So, and I'm still learning right now. It's a punch here and there, <laughs> but uh, it is uh, something that uh, before we even uh, commit, this is all the things that we know as we go along that we have to say. So that readiness also include into the uh, scalability, whether you can really manage all this technical as well as people. That's from me. All right, thank you, Ms. Lisa, for chiming in. So let's move on to Mr. Adrian. What are other strategies that you have, Mr. Adrian? So I, I totally echo, um, I can call you Sean, right? Jay Sean, like a bit, no? like, like Jay Chow. Um, yeah, sure, so, yeah. Sean, <laughs> So, so um, talk to as many people as you can. Um, and, and the thing is, um, with, with any idea, um, you have to know that, you know, seven similar people on the, on the planet Earth have the same idea as you. 
And the fact of the matter is that you you need to you need to have a secret source. Uh, uh, I mean, if, if a startup doesn't have a secret source, so the secret source is basically uh, what makes you different, what makes you, um, you know, somebody that is untouchable in a sense that if you have a secret source that nobody can replicate. Um, or, so basically the secret sauce comes from a recipe of, of cooking, right? So if, if your secret sauce is, is something that people cannot replicate, then uh, talk to as many people as, as possible, uh, try to get feedback from them, uh, try to network as many as can. I think now with Discord and, you know, so many other, um, you know, chat and, and, and competitions like hackathons like this, you're networking with the rest of the world, you know, you're, you're looking at a thousand people from the rest of uh, 100 over universities that you're already networking with, right? So that, that's one. And of course, uh, the first customer is very important. Um, so I share with you one of the startups that I have, uh, uh, which is Joan Selman. And so we were, we were, so, so the, the wife was pregnant with the kid and, and she was asking for fresh salmon every week. And so it was burning a hole in my pocket. And so because it was burning a hole in pocket, I decided to go and find a distributor or a fisherman that was, you know, rearing salmon and it was as far as Norway. And so I realized that the fish is not as small as a, a tingiri or a, a, a siaka, which is 300 grams, it's, it's five kilos, right? So how do you finish a five kilo fish? So the first thing I did was, you know, find, uh, you know, my friends, my family. And then so the, the first week was fine. We, we managed to, to, you know, tong tong and group by and then everyone had one kilo and then everybody happy. Then the next week came right now. It's like, everybody's like, oh, no, no, enough already. I had last week already. So, and that, that was a problem to solve, right? So, so the, the, the fact of, of Lisa not, not um, getting married to the technology uh, is, is, is a, is a, is a, it's a phrase that I learned from a, a friend from Oil and Gas. Um, and his, his phrase was always uh, marry the problem. Do not marry the technology, do not marry the solution. Always marry the problem. And when you, when you marry the problem and you have a problem to solve, and it, if it is your problem and it manifests to everybody else's problem, then you realize that you have something there. And so that's what happened uh, from my wife to my family the first week to 3,000 people on a Facebook group. I was selling salmon by cutting five kilo fishes down to 200 grams. And so the, the whole point of uh, what I'm trying to say is that um, to validate uh, something is, of course, if you can validate it internally and there's a need for it internally. And then once you've fulfilled that need internally, then you look out and then you find your first customer and second customer and so on and so forth. Um, and also the fact that, you know, the, the technologies are always there, you know, AI, you know, blockchain and everything. but it's always the use cases. What problems are you solving, right? So in, in order to validate, sometimes um, um, the don't, don't be afraid of, of, of sharing. I've, I've met a lot of people that go like, oh, uh, I scared people take my idea, you know, then they replicate me and stuff. And like, and so if, if, if it's so easy replicable, then it's not a startup idea. You probably don't need to make it a startup because if it's so easy for someone to do it and the idea is there's no secret sauce to it, then, you know, and then always look at, uh, um, I, I don't like this word, lah, it's competitors. Um, uh, Jack Ma used to say there's 9 billion people in the world today. There's no such thing as competitors when they, he was questioned um, during his um, listing on, on, on NASDAQ. And so look at what other people are doing uh, in the same space. Uh, don't be jago kampong and, you know, pat yourself on the back and say, you know, I'm the best, right? And then you ask them, um, who are the people that is doing animation in Malaysia? And then you don't even know who's doing it, right? Um, so that's basically both market research and as well as um, people who are doing the same thing. Lah. Not so much competitor. Lah. Because I think um, if, if you're Muslim and, and, and you're a believer, um, uh, Rezeki is... I always tell my hackathon teams, lah, they, they go like, oh, same idea. What? Yeah, but you know, there's a lot to do with execution. There's a lot to do with the team. The co-founders, you know, there's a lot to do with, with a lot of other things other than so if, if Rizaki is meant for you. And uh, my final takeaway in terms of validation is istikara. Lah. It's always worked for me. Uh, if you don't know whether it's right for you, just put your head down on the floor, pray, and then ask, ask whether it's validated or not. Yeah. Thanks. I thank you, Mr. Adrian. I've heard twice already talk to people and networking from Mr. Jay Sean and Mr. Adrian. So participants. Make take note, yeah. Must make friends and then talk to people and have uh and do network, okay? 
A big thanks again to our panelists for providing insights into strategies for validating tech startup ideas. Those are indeed effective strategies worth implementing. Let's transition to the next question. What advice would you give in terms of identifying viable market opportunities, validating their ideas, and effectively pitching their solutions to potential stakeholders and investors? Let's start off by passing the question to Mr. Idrit. What are some advice that you would give to potential stakeholders and investors? Hmm. Um, so there's, there's, this, there's this famous phrase in terms of uh, stakeholders. Uh, um, you have to get uh, buy-ins from stakeholders. And so when you have anything in life, whether it's you know doing a, a simple project with your friends, doing a hackathon, um, you have to have buy-in from stakeholders. So what, what buy-in from stakeholders um, is is basically having everybody on the same line or the same plane or the same mission, right? And so um, when when you when you pitch your solution, um, I, I I like to I, I like to use the word kiss, which is keep it short and simple, um, and and the elevator pitch. I think um, ten minutes is a bit too long um, because you tend to lose the audience uh, when it's too long. Um, so basically, if you want to uh, pitch it to your stakeholders and investors. So your stakeholders can be uh, your teammates, your your CTO, your marketing guy, and your investors can be initially your your father, mother, or your uh, auntie, uncle that has extra money that you know uh, that you can actually use as a runway, or is is um, you know government agencies where you want to actually um, get your grants and and whatever not right, um, or whether it's um, pitching and stuff like that in terms of of. Um, other funding. So basically, um, in 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 general, is basically to get buy-ins, um, and also to find um, investors that are. So so there's 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 two phrases here, which is uh, sweat equity, and smart money. Now um, the difference between smart money and and sweat equity is that if your co-founders is not going to sweat with you, uh, perlu huh? That means to say they're not going to do the work with you then they're not very good co-founders. Um, if they're just in it for the right, they're not going to sweat with you, then it's it's something that you need to consider. Now, smart money. And money money is everywhere. Uh, alhamdulillah, you know, if you need money, you just ask. Uh, sometimes it comes in, in many forms and in, in many denominations. But now, smart money is when um, what Sean said in terms of access, network access. So an investor can have a lot of money. He can be a dato or somebody in, in the space, but he has no clue of the technology no clue of the subject matter and then that's doom and gloom for me because he's not going to bring value to the money so so that's just my two takes on it all right thank you mr adrian for the advice what about miss lisa what what advice would you give to them um I may not be as detailed as what uh, Mr. Adrian was mentioning. He has better perspective. Uh, he, he seems to have a lot of uh, understanding of the space. But uh, for me, it's probably uh, simpler. I'm looking at passion and purpose. So, so long, uh, of course, passion alone cannot just work like that. So it has to be purpose. So understanding people's needs is uh, the angle that you should come from. To begin with and then to conquer the market you just need to focus on delivering the value build the trust and fostering genuine connection uh, at the end of the day you can build like mentioned most advanced rocket but if you can't sell it then you won't reach the star so uh, that is like very big statement but go deeper uh, is always questioning yourself uh, the answer is actually within you. That's that's my short answer. All right. Thank you, Miss Lisa, for the advice. Lastly, let's hear from Mr. Jay Sean for the for other advices. Hmm. Well, for identifying the viable market opportunities, I would always say to look for the problems and not the product. Like really, really identify the unmet needs, those gaps, the pain points faced by the audiences, the market. 
don't just jump into creating a product not knowing if it's going to be solving the issue first. So maybe that's the first part. Um, and I think more towards what uh, Adrian mentioned also when you're actually getting funding. Uh, I really, really do try to advise startups that are, yes, money is everywhere. <laughs> money is everywhere. But make sure there is value in what you're getting. If you can get the funding, but this, that doesn't mean that it will bring value and impact to your startup. You must understand that uh, when you're bringing in partners, uh, you know, taking your equity, that is actually something to be really, you have to think thoroughly that if that value will open up doors for you or not. Because that is a very important thing. Um, and I always tell startups that no one pitch deck is for everything. Uh, make sure you tailor your storytelling, tailor your decks for your targeted audience. So if you're going for VC funding, make sure you tailor it for VC funding. If you're going for grants, tailor it for grants. If it's an awareness uh, campaign for your product, for your startup, make sure you craft your storytelling around the awareness. Don't uh, try to put everything to one deck and then uh, it's never enough. You can never give uh, too, there'll be too much information. Sometimes we say TMI, too much information. Uh, people will just, move on from that. So I think just that's my two cents. Right, look for the problems, not the product, and also find value and impact in what we get. So I uh, thank you for answering the question. Uh, it is evident that the advice for of all our panelists carries a lot of vitality. Now, let's take a five minutes break to recharge. We'll reconvene shortly. Thank you again to the panelists for the delightful discussion. I'm sure that the participants are thrilled to hear more. Before that, let's take a five minutes break to recharge before continuing the discussion. At the same time, feel free to post your question for the Q&A section by clicking the link provided in the chat box. Your question will be addressed by the panelists during the Q&A section. In the meantime, grab yourself some drinks and snacks and we'll be carrying on shortly.
Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome back our panelists to continue today's discussion. Your attention is highly appreciated. For the respective panelists, the stage is once again yours. I'm sure that all our participants are eagerly anticipating the second half of the discussion. Without any further ado, let's get right into it. The next question is, what strategies and approaches can tech entrepreneurs employ to consistently maintain a competitive edge and stay ahead of their competitors? Ms. Lisa, what are some strategies that you would like to offer to tech entrepreneurs? Um, thank you so much for the question. Um, strategy is a word. Uh, if you keep thinking about strategy, you feel very stressful. So my approach come back to very simple, you know, like what Dory says, like just keep swimming and keep swimming and keep swimming. Seriously, um, I'm not joking. This sounds simple when you are so doomed, you are so stuck, you don't know what else, you just join your kids and watch this. Well, of course not now, my kids is like over 20 years old, like 24 years old. So I remember those days when I sit down with him, watching this, just keep swimming and keep swimming, you know. Yes, that's what you do in life. Just go on and go on and go on. And another one that I like to always uh, remember is run forest, run. Just keep run. And you see how forest actually succeeded. That's all. It's, it's just that this is the simplest approach. Um, you're talking about strategy. There's so many strategy books here and there. But again, it's just about, uh, uh, you know, keeping your momentum and never give up. Just go through it. Just go through it. So. This actually applies not only to tech entrepreneurship, anything, even if, if you sell burgers, the same thing. So at the end of the day, it's the consistency, your, how you're consistent, you can outpace your competitors. So it is crucial to foster a culture of creativity, collaborate with the team, embrace emerging technologies, prioritize customer. Prioritize customer is of course the same. Uh, no matter how tired you are, no matter, you know, they can be super fussy, beyond beyond tolerance. <laughs> this is how you deal with life. So, uh, just go along with them, and uh, just stay attuned to the market, and then uh, leveraging uh, data-driven insights, fostering mindset uh, to always have this lifelong learning. And I open myself to what we call in Malaysia, right? Biarlah kena tembak, 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 tembak. You know, you just don't die. So, uh, so this is how you actually can maintain uh, the, your, in the competitive edge. So you still be there and embrace new knowledge, learn, no matter how many times you are, you know, <laughs> can attend but also you just go on. So this is the only way, I think. That's for me. All right. Thank you, Ms. Lisa, for the strategies like push through and consistency is always the key, right? So let's move on to Mr. Adrian next. What are other approaches that would you like to give to other tech entrepreneurs? Ni Cik Lisa ni, uh, your, your seal ni can share. I nak kena tembak juga tapi tak tahu macam mana nak hidup lah lepas tu kena tembak tu. And then, sorry lah, um, ni nak berenang ke nak lari ni? Chorus ni kena berlari dan lepas tu nak swim, swim, swim ni. Lepas tu nak berlari ni macam Iron Man je. But I mean, it's, it's true, it's true. Um, I think... Being lifelong learners is, is something that a lot of co-founders need to to be. Um, so so my my advice to to staying uh, competitive again I I don't really like the word in terms of competitors. Um, the the more you look at your competitors, the the more you start comparing, and then you you don't end up doing your own thing. Um, but again, um, number one is customers. Um, the, um those days when when we were when we were doing salmon, uh, we could have outsourced the delivery to to someone else in terms of logistics. Um, but I took it upon me to actually deliver because I wanted to see who my customers were. Uh, I wanted to see where they live, what car they drove. Uh, I wanted to talk to them and see why they're buying from me, right? And of course, I didn't say, oh, I'm I'm the co-founder or anything. I just, you know, deliver and then just do small chat, lah, you know. And that's your, your survey, right? So customers. And then I think in this age, uh, data is very crucial. So um, when you have data, you can make very informed decisions. Lah. Um, so like, for instance, um, you know, your demographics in terms of where they stay, who your, your first customer is, and how do you find your second customer based on your first customer, right? And then always invest in your, your, both your technology and your people. 
I think uh, constant in investing in, in your people is always very important because actually uh, most of the problems today uh, in terms of the tech world and all is, is not the technology, it's always the people. Uh, whether it's your co-founders, your stakeholders, your investors, always managing people. That, that's always the key. And the other two things um, uh, to, to, stay, to stay at the edge is always innovate uh, and always be agile. So meaning to say um, you always come up with new things um, always, always, always uh, be dynamic. Don't always stick with something in the comfort zone. Um, and then try to be agile. Agile means uh, if you find uh, a potentially something that is better than what you're doing now, and then if everybody is uh, on, on the same page and you have buy-ins from your stakeholders, then, you know, there's this huge word, which is pivot. Lah. Um, so a lot of companies, a lot of startups have, have pivoted from... Um, so like give you an example, a startup like Purely B, who is funded by Finder Startups, have pivoted from being content. Uh, now they have their own product. And so um, it, you know, it's 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 just time will tell what they can pivot to and, and where you'll go on to. La. Yeah. So that's my take on it. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Idrit. Invest in your technology and your people, right? I've heard this uh through through other sources as well, where they say people uh what shape your uh, shape shape your Tech, technology and your business yeah. itself. So if you take care of your people, then it will definitely boom. So now let's uh, thank you for the insightful approach. And now let's uh, hear from Mr. Jay Sean for the strategies and approaches that can be employed by tech entrepreneurs. Maybe I'll just echo the sound, Adrian. They've covered a full uh, part of it. So um, easy being the third person, right? Yeah. <laughs> Just go like, yay, two versus yay. <laughs> like, I think what uh, Adrian said also, and also Lisa said, uh, there needs to be a lot of uh, continuous improvement within your startup. You know, um, your customers are the first place where you can collect those data, as Adrian said. Those are the important data where you can actually build upon what you can improve and not really focus on your competitors uh, because user and customer experience is a priority, especially with uh, tech startups. Um, and always never be afraid to embrace changes like uh, Adrian uh, highlighted, pivot. You know, startups always pivot uh, depending on the uh, customer feedback, their stakeholders. Uh, uh, decision making from top down and above. So never be afraid of changes as also trends tend to keep changing. So you have to be a child and always adapt to what is currently uh, hot out there. Um, and always try to, you can never future proof yourself, but you can estimate what may come depending on the data you uh, get. And those changes will come instantaneously at times. So never back down and always have strategies to adapt and change where you can. Um, and one of the things that I always tell startups is you need to have that competitive intelligence. So being informed is a very crucial thing. Uh, don't be in your own bubble. Uh, get to know what others are doing. Um, I have this interesting story to actually share. Uh, this startup, uh, I'm not sure if I can share because uh, they did talk to me. And, you know, they didn't want to share how they did it and stuff like that. But the interesting part is how they validated their idea. Initially, a yeah, very early stage startup. Uh, they couldn't get validation from within the local ecosystem itself. So they leveraged on social media. They went on LinkedIn, Instagram, trying to connect with global VCs. Mind you, they are very early stage. Uh, means they only have the idea part done, uh, not fully developed yet. And they actually validated their idea by reaching out to global networks. So going on LinkedIn, trying to reach out to them, talk to them, validate their idea. And these are still very young entrepreneurs. So that was a very interesting take for me on how they did it. Uh, you know, that the neutral way, 
they actually just throw themselves out there to get validation. That is uh, one of the ways that I find very interesting. Yeah, that's something we don't have last time, you see. You don't have LinkedIn, don't have the internet. Where can just message like some CEO, you know, like this this days the Gen Z and the Gen Alpha so lucky. Internet, Discord, TikTok, then straight away you got this CEO guy in your pocket, you know what I mean? Ah uh, Liza, I dah tahu dah. You punya you punya shield tu yang tembak-tembak tu yang Sean kata we need to be like children. So it's child punya pistol kan. <laughs> I have gotten the important part of Mr. Jay Sean's um, uh, answer, which is don't be afraid to embrace changes and adapt. So um, let's move. I, those are indeed in just interesting strategies that I hope I will find valuable. Now, let's shift our focus to the next question at hand. Building a strong team is crucial for the success of any tech ventures. What qualities do you look for when recruiting team members and how do you ensure the alignment with the mission and values of your startup? Um, let's start off with Ms. Lisa. Okay, thank you so much. This is such an interesting question. First of all, allow me to say something. I really envy uh, Mr. Adam because he has like 150 engineers. Am I right? No, that's not my engineers. Those are those are my colleagues, so don't envy, please. There's a whole company thousand five hundred, yeah. So don't don't envy, please. <laughs> so I I love to be in that environment. I don't have that luxury anymore in in this startup world. So I have to suffer a lot. I have to reframe my my thought process of hiring. It's completely different because I used to work in big organization, big companies, MNCs, GLCs. So it's very easy to get the uh, American top views, you know the Ivy League uh, student because you come with money, right? Yep. But for startup is different altogether. So what I learned is uh, I admit the biggest mistake that I would like to also share with everyone here. I started up with like I'm opening a big company. So I started up with uh, a Stramble Heart on the first day. Uh, well, that one is not wrong. That one is correct. But I started up with like setting up all the departments. So, and I have start hiring based on departments and I will make sure that everybody has the right thing. And of course I can manage, but what I do not have is money. So immediately after perhaps six to seven months, I had to let go about uh, 15 uh, out of 22. They're just remaining about four or five critical ones. Uh, in fact, about, uh, within the four or five, uh, like half of them are interns. So. So I have to start that from zero uh, with a lot of that. So this is one thing that uh, I learned. So building strong team for a startup uh, has to focus on value over monetary incentive, right? Because when I was young, fresh graduate, first thing I see is how much salary I'm getting, what are the benefits? Then I start comparing off a letter to another off a letter. I think everybody does that. So, but this for, for, for uh, startup is different. And the good thing about in today's world is that uh, today's kids are so, uh, um, what do you call this, fortunate in the sense that their parents are well to do. So, my criteria number one is study anak orang kaya. Okay? <laughs> because their focus is not money, <laughs> their focus is passion. So, they are, they, are, they are trained to like have a clear vision what they are going to be in a decade. But how are you going to afford their salary? <laughs> okay, this is where oh, they come in because yeah, are not orang kaya, they don't care about salary. <laughs> okay. okay, okay, you know, like I'm talking about oh, 2000 je ke, nak bayar rumah lagi, kereta lagi, cannot enough. You see, then parents lagi, nak kahwin lagi, suddenly got anak lagi. This is real thing. Eh? So, so this kind of traits cannot fit into the team, honestly speaking. The traits that can fit into a startup is either anak orang kaya, so because Money is not the first thing in their mind. Go to Garibu is nothing. So they are looking at what they can get, what they can learn, what they can achieve, what kind of empire. So either we offer them ESOS or something like this. So they can really work with you uh, and really go grow with you. This is number one uh, attribute, lah, if you ask me. So the mindset is about grow. Grow, 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 grow. And they see the future ahead, not now. So, so this is the meaning. 
So, so I, think, I think this is, is um, um, I, 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 I think this is, is uh, already a uh, 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 like, 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 so 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 there's, there's a bit of from, from uh, work. work. And they are eager to start. At the same time, money, money is the main yeah. Just to make, make sure, sure that, that they don't have to prison. Okay, this, this is another thing that you have, have to. You, to, you cannot you afford to have uh, a lot of challenges. So, this is how I, I, I am. The, the way to, to manage them are different into this world because we are working in remote, we are doing software. Uh, we have to micromanage, and the way to do setting up a strong team is a flat organization, not a long organization. So that means being a CEO, you have to talk to everyone every day. If not once a day, it will be two times a day. This is the only way for you to make everybody really strong, really, really aligned, really together. So this is a strong team. It's not the number. It's the the, the strong. Uh, cohesiveness, working together spirit, and we celebrate every little achievement. Uh, so that's that's my my gist lah of how to build a strong team for startup. For startup. Okay. Back to you. All right, thank you. I've heard it value more than monetary investments, right? And then always look ahead. So um thank you for your input and now let's pass to Mr. Jay Sean for his input. Um from my side, I think, yes, uh, for startups, technical skills and expertise is one of the key components. However, those uh, technical experts need to be able to also communicate and collaborate because you can have the best specialists in your technical team, but they cannot communicate with other team members. That is going to cause chaos and a lot of miscommunication down the road. So when you're actually building a team, uh, make sure as the leader, the founder, what is to actually craft out your vision and being able to share that vision with your team members and make sure they, are, they can share that vision and understand where the startup is going, where the company is going, where, you would like to push forward. So the passion and drive, like uh, Lisa said, it's very important when you're recruiting those members. If they are only looking for mon monetary uh, get back and stuff like that, then, and they don't align with the company's mission, goals, and vision, um, then you will need to make hard decisions uh, along the road. So. Those are the things that I think uh, qualities that I look for my team members, but I would say the most important out of all is the communication and collaboration part. Because in a startup, you run lean. When you run lean, um, your job scope will be quite all over the place. You'll be handling a few things, even though you're the engineer, you might need to manage stakeholders as well. You know, you will be in different, different job scopes overlapping because of how small a startup is until you slowly go towards the growth stage. That's when you expand and learn to delegate more. So as an early stage startup, communication and collaboration, that's what I look for in my team members. All right. Thank you, Mr. Jay Sean. I heard it again, communication is always the key and also share vision and share the passion and drive together. So thank you, Mr. Jay Sean. Let's hear from Mr. Adrian now. So I, um, just for the record, uh, Lisa, I, I don't run a startup currently. The 150 is a company that I'm working for. Uh, it's a public listed company from China. Uh, I used to run startups, not anymore. I've hung up my, my entrepreneurship code, so to say. Um, but, um, you know, the, e the easy answer to question number seven is I, I echo both of you. Um, I, I agree totally. 
um, I think um, what Lisa said in terms of uh, passion, purpose, and value, and being lifelong learners is is very crucial. So, um, I think the whole team needs to also communicate well, as what Sean said in terms of um, because you're being lean and and there's not many um, you know uh, teammates in in the team. Um, of course, there's, there's nothing wrong with, with building uh, what, what Lisa built in terms of a, a, 20, a 22 man team where all the departments are in place because, you know, that's where you came from, right? So, um, again, uh, you know, there's, there's no right or wrong in terms of that. Um, but having said that, um, I think um, to, to echo uh, both the panelists, I think uh, finding a right team member, uh, be it a co-founder or teammate, is actually... Um, very much to do with aligning with the culture lah. so um, like for instance you're not going to hire someone who's um, say say if you have a fashion startup then you're doing e-commerce you're not going to hire someone that has no fashion sense right um, and I also I also know um, so there's, there's some clients that I, I used to have in the, the e-commerce space that was actually doing fashion and uh, you're so right Lisa I tell you the cars that we saw outside the, the startup was like, you know, all the fast cars, two-door cars. And then we were like, you know, how does this startup actually afford to pay their salaries? You know, it's like, and 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 so the, the rich, um, uh, fortunately, Silver Spoon um, have different goals or different needs in, in hand. Um, so it, it, it's, I guess, a, a secret sauce that Lisa has in terms of hiring people other than interns um, is that the fact that the rich don't see money uh, and they always see purpose and value and impact. And so these are the people that you want to hire. Of course, you need to also sell yourself and provide some a, a platform for them to actually, uh, you know, um, want to contribute to. Lah. So that's why um, your startup has to have a certain amount of impact, a certain amount of um, value that you bring uh, to the market. Lah. So I guess for the fashionista and the OOTD people is, uh, they always want to be at the forefront and 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 taking the next OOTD picture, uh, you know, of 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 fashion e-commerce that they they don't need to buy and they don't need to order and return. Uh. So again, um, every different startup has different um, uh, goals and vision. So basically, finding the right fit um, in terms of technology, I think, um, sad to say, a lot of uh, uh, techies are. Uh, so uh, this one don't trust uh. I I know a lot of USM and uh, technology people um when you when you hard up your computer screen and your mouse and your keyboard i know you don't like to talk to people um but listen to jason uh, communication is key and so a lot of startups they do um, what they call a, a stand up or a, a weekly uh uh what's that thing called i can't remember they, they they do this weekly thing where the ceo and everybody sits in the same room uh lost for words what's the what's the word for it um town hall yeah okay so they do they do a lot of town hall uh meetings in startups and and, and that's basically uh how you find fit in terms of, of teams uh, yeah all right thank you mr adrian i'm sure to hear everyone's insights on building a strong team for tech ventures indeed those qualities are definitely the most important when recruiting team members now Let's move on to the following question. What skills and qualities do you believe are essential for success as an entrepreneur in technology? Mr. Jason, what do you think are the most essential skills and qualities? I think uh, there's no doubt about it. Like if you're the founder, then leadership and communication is the main priority, the essence that you will really need. Yes, you may be, you will have to share your vision, but understand that you also need to be a very active listener because the team is small. Uh, you're going to have to communicate every day. Uh, but sometimes when you are, some people may lose focus when they are the leader, they tend to be a bit too pushy and they don't start listening to their teams. Uh, that is one of the crucial thing, active listening, uh, always understand that they may be feedback within your team based on their inputs and you will always grow some more because even though if you're the CEO, you're the founder, you're the leader, uh, always know that you also can make mistakes, but you can always learn from them. Always pick up yourself, uh, because your team is your 
one of their secret sauce, uh, basically. Once you hire them, they're the secret sauce on building your startup. Uh, the other thing would be problem solving skills and hard decision making. So decision making is a very tough one for especially new entrepreneurs. You know, uh, there will come a time where you will have to make hard decisions. I think Lisa also uh, mentioned that in the previous question, you know, when you had to lay off, lay off is one of the hardest things to do as a founder. When you have to lay off people, uh, a lot of things will happen, you know, emotions come into place and everything. These are the things that a entrepreneur or founder will need to really look into because these are the hardships that will come uh, as part of the part of your journey to also growing. So skills, qualities, I think these are the things that are very important. That's my thing. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Mr. Jisha. Leadership, communication, being active listener is also one of it. And also hard decision making. This is something that we often we often go through if we are a leader of some sort. So thank you again for answering the question. Now let's move on to Mr. Adrian. What do you think are the most essential? Uh, Jason covered everything, Eddie. But I'll just give you an example of what happened to me. Um, and and I also echo Lisa's um, as as a as a as a co-founder or as a leader. Uh, for a startup, the most difficult um, time is um, the hiring and firing and also making decisions. Um, unfortunately for me, uh, when I started out my journey after winning a hackathon, um, I had five teammates on my on my plate. And so at that time, um, there were not many, many startups. I think I've mentioned some of the names of the startups. And so the reason why I mentioned their names is because they're close to heart and I've actually um, had mentoring from them. And so the biggest, um, I, I won't say it's a regret, but it's something that I've, I've lived by until today um, was that I had um, ill advice uh, from one of the co-founders and I had to, I had, I have to deal with it today. Uh, we had five co-founders and uh, his advice was uh, five co-founders co are actually too many for a startup. Now, um, fast forward one year later when I, when I, when I burned bridges with two of my key technical uh, co-founders and we were left with three, which was a very nice size for co-founders, um, which was the advice from uh, this mentor of mine. Um, Purely B had seven co-founders. Um, and so they, again, uh, there's no right or wrong, um, but it was a hard decision to make. And um, we, we have to live by the decisions that we make. Um, whether we like it or not. And so, um, and, and, and it's something that you, they don't teach you in school. I mean, entrepreneurship is not something that they teach you in school. Um, I mean, of course, if you go to MIT and Stanford, they have an entrepreneurship course, but, you know, learning the theory and, and dealing with people on the ground and, and having uh, experienced it is, is, is so much different. And so I, I guess the, one of the reasons why all the panelists and, and why the session is today is we want to not have, uh, you know, 270 of you listening in make the same mistakes or for the matter um don't do what we did and 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 do it your way or, or do it the right way that you think is best for you right so um it's again um essential for success again it's, it's very subjective like you know so you you can make a trillion dollars you can make uh, a social impact of 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 like picha eats and benefiting the social enterprise space where you know uh unhcr um, people are actually cooking and, and serving the Malaysian audience uh, of a social enterprise. So it's, again, success is, is, is very different. But in the technology space, I think um, the secret sauce is in the, the, the techies and, and the programmers and developers. I think these are your, your core ingredients for uh, a successful startup. Lah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Adrian, for the clarification. Last but not least, what do you think of the question, Ms. Lisa? Thank you so much. I <clears throat> I tend to give a, a generic answer, but instead I think I should share a specific one. Uh, of course, persistence is the key. That is like everybody knows about it. But 
we are talking about specifically entrepreneur in technology. So, uh, I'm in the startup space, actually new but old, because my age is too old, but uh, the startup uh, uh, scene is new. So, I have to um, be able to uh, mix well with the youngsters. That's pretty much like 20 years younger than me. So what I learned is uh, they have the, uh, they, 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 um, while I have the technology, they have the energy. So, uh, but what they don't have is communication. It's not only communication with me, but communication among themselves. So while, um, what I would like to uh, add in here is handholding. So this handholding has to happen. So, uh, and we're talking about working in a team, for example, or making the team work together. It's talking about like playing a game, passing the ball. You cannot just pass the ball to the air. You have to ensure that, that somebody picks up the ball and the, the speed is fast. So to make sure this happens, you have to be there at every point. To make sure that have you done it have he accepted it can he do it have you checked it have you value so all this sounds like very micromanaging but you cannot help it if you don't do that it just it just didn't happen so this leadership is just to ensure that everything is moving and whatever obstacle you are there to help not to push them like you know push them to the edge that they cannot do you still push them you know Scream or school, that doesn't work in today's world. But instead, if they cannot do it there, get help from outside. So let that learning process happen and they will feel happy and they will learn how to, to communicate. So, uh, because entrepreneurship is just a word, essentially, it's just a business. So, how you run a business if you don't make sure the ball runs as fast as possible, correctly, and everything, you know? Don't let any drop, any ball drops. So my 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 way or the skills that we need to have to ensure the quality is really uh to, to handhold, handhold in a sense that not doing it for them, but ensuring that it's being done correctly, and ensuring that the other party who takes the thing really can do it. If he cannot do it, identify why, and that why you have to resolve. So that's the quality that I think uh, critical. Otherwise. Yeah, along the way, things just disappear. Uh, All right, thank you, Miss Lisa. Qualities are truly essential for success as an entrepreneur in the technology field. Now, let's proceed to the last question of the day. What advice would you give to aspiring entrepreneurs who are hesitant to start their own venture in the tech industry? Miss Lisa, what are some advice that you would give to aspiring entrepreneurs? Okay, um, actually, I really love the, the word that uh, uh, Mr. Adrian mentioned earlier on. Two words. That is um, talking about rezeki. Essentially, uh, what is called lah, rezeki in English, so you don't know what to say. Abundance. But if it is stated for you, it's stated for you. Durian right? Ruto. Okay. And, then, <laughs> yeah. and then another thing is about Ishihara. And you really have to bow down. And there's nothing else. Because if you work in a company, uh your 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 reporting is to the to the boss now you're in startup no boss your boss is up there okay we we, we must believe in some 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 existence uh, so we, that is like soul searching so every time you have to pray okay whatever pain you are doing just pray all right so and at the end you have to trust the process and remember timing is the key if it doesn't happen today it will happen some somewhere along the road so for, for our aspiring entrepreneurs in the tech industry, I say trust the process and remember timing is the key. Okay, um, starting your own venture can feel daunting, but don't let hesitation hold you back. Don't let it hold you back. So embrace every journey, knowing the challenge will arise, but also recognizing the opportunities that they present for growth. So all the challenges is meant for you to grow. Keep all the positive vibes. Um, the thing that I always learn from everyone uh, across age, across race, 
uh, uh, perhaps uh, across a uh, globe as well, uh, just mingle around with the same set of people, positive, because we all go through uh, the ups and downs together. So trust the process, people. That's all. All right. Thank you, Miss Lisa. I heard it again. Trust the process and mingle around. This has come around a lot of times. So participants, take note again. So thank you, Miss Lisa, for the amazing advices. What other advices would you give to the aspiring ent entrepreneurs, Mr. Jay Sean? Um, I would always say if you're still building your confidence, um, always start with small talk and through small talk, validate your idea. So you know, get yourself, your group of friends, talk to them, what kind of ideas you have, you know, build those confidence up before jumping out from that network. Um, other than that, if you're more engaging type, I would suggest that um, find a supportive network. You know, uh, there are other startups out there that maybe that are just still very early stage, still building, try to mingle around with those. For example, if now you've known uh, Mr. Adrian also, you've known uh, Lisa, you know, if you have something, uh, you already have that network right now through here, uh, build those network. Those are the supportive network that you have. Uh, don't be afraid to reach out, you know, uh, always take the opportunity to build a network where you may feel, you don't know if people may come, uh, they may help you right now. They may not help you right now, but in the future, your journey, two or three years time, uh, those people may be your biggest backers. Uh, you may never know, these uh, angels will come and go. So never be afraid to be in different groups. Don't stay in your bubble. Uh, that's what I would always say. Uh, always jump out, pop the bubble and jump out. <laughs> the, the sea is so vast. So go around. Uh, take, take, always uh, move away from your comfort zone. Maybe that's a simple way to put it. Don't put yourself in a, once you're in that comfort zone and you don't step out, then you will not start growing. So there's always potential for you to grow. Don't put yourself down too much. That's how I would give up to aspiring entrepreneurs. Thank you, Mr. Jay Sean. I, also, I get it a lot. Get out of your comfort zone. It's something that everybody is telling us, but it's so hard to do. So I hope our participants today will try. It's like another motivation for them to step out of their comfort zone. So I think we can move on to Mr. Adrian for this question. Um, yeah, so there's there's a lot. I mean, there's a lot to say in this this last answer. Um, so I, I echo Sean in terms of starting small, um, starting lean, and um, also, um, in terms of trusting the process, what Lisa said, uh, I think um, Sean also mentioned, but I think um, I, my, my, my take on it is, is you need to trust yourself. Lah. So believe in yourself. I think uh, Sean mentioned there was one, one Malaysian team that couldn't get validation in Malaysia. They decided to validate themselves outside. Um, a lot of times, um, whatever you believe in, not everybody would believe in you as well. Um, and, and sometimes you have to, I mean, entrepreneurship is about um, going against the grain, uh, um, there's, there's this huge word in the entrepreneurship uh, industry where you're, you're meant to disrupt or, 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 or make a change, right? And so how do you disrupt people that if, you, if they're all doing it the same way, right? And so um, when I started a lot of my startups, um, a lot of people were saying, oh, you know, a lot of naysayers, they go like, oh, you cannot do this. Uh, um, they're already doing it this way. You know, what, what differentiates from you? You know, even the, the big four consultings were saying, um, why are you only selling one product in terms of salmon? Why don't you sell more products like the supermarket? It's like, you know, so there's a lot of people that will, will start, you know, whispering to you, you know, but um, the, the idea here is to believe in yourself. Um, and uh, since Lisa likes to keep swimming, uh, run for us, run and catch the ball. So, you know, play a lot of sports and make sure you follow these three 
uh, rules of thumb la, in the in the sense that you know um, be lifelong learners uh, never 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 stop learning it's always continuously learning new things um, a lot of technologies today like ai blockchain um, they were not here they were not here when you know i was in the in the industry 20 years ago um, we, we never heard of things like this right and so um, in the next five years there'll be new technologies that come on and so if you don't embrace and learn uh, like what Lisa said, um, then you're going to be either left behind or you're going to be still hesitant and not take the, the leap of faith. Lah. And and so I think coming from uh, corporate and, and going into entrepreneurship is, is, is quite difficult in a sense. Um, but um, for students uh, like myself, when I when I started off, um, after I graduated, um, I I just I just started off, lah, you know, just got myself a laptop and then just started off, right? So, um, at that stage, you can you can take gambles in your life because you're young and eager and energetic. Uh, you know, not like Lisa and me. We're not very far apart anyway by age, Lisa. So, um, but I, I I really salute you and I, I I see I see the endurance that you have. Um, and then a lot of people are asking like you know Adrian, are you still going to go back and be an entrepreneur? Are you still going to you know? So as, as much as um. As much advice that I like to give uh, in terms of mentoring um, is also to uh, find a good mentor. Uh, I think that's very crucial in the early stages. Find a good mentor. If 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 the if the mentor doesn't work for you, find many mentors, uh, and then make a decision for yourself. Always believe in yourself, and always, always, always embrace failure, because um, it's always a learning opportunity. And and so at this stage in my life, um, when I when I turned forty, I I realized I looked at the I looked at the bank account and I look at all the events I go to eat free food um, just to stay afloat. Um, and I realized that, you know, you know, making other people's rice bowls and salaries meet at the end of the day was was my objective. And now that I see my bank account and, and no more events to go to because everything was COVID and online. So um, I realized that uh, going back to corporate isn't uh, a failure in a sense, but I still use a lot of my entrepreneurship skills in where I am today. Um, so I think uh, my advice to all of you is that um, those that win and go on to the next level use this as a platform, as a springboard to many, many, many more uh, hackathons or you know engage with the likes of Cradle and and a lot of mentors and see where your ideas take you lah. Yeah. So um, just keep swimming. Uh, run forest, gram. Run forest without the chocolates and uh, make sure you catch the ball that Lisa throws at you. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Adrian. Those are indeed valuable pieces of advice that I'm sure all of us appreciate. Thank you so much, Ms. Lisa, Mr. Jason, and Mr. Adrian for taking the time to join us for this insightful discussion. Now, let me pass the floor back to the MC. Thank you to the speakers for adding various knowledge into this discussion. Moving to our next agenda. We invite our participants to ask questions and partake in the Q&A section. You can post your question by scanning the QR code shown on the screen or by using the link shared in the chat box. Please ask any question that you have to help clear up any misunderstanding. Additionally, I encourage everyone to leave a like below the question that, I, that you are interested in hearing more about on the Padlet. Given our time constraint, we will prioritize answering the question with the most light. Thank you for your participation. And now let's get the ball rolling for our Q&A session with the first question of the day. Hi speakers. Is it hard to cope with entrepreneurship for people that have no background in the field? Um, it's open to all three of you, so you can just um, jump in. Ladies, ladies first. Okay, I I pick the 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 one the one question here. It says, is it hard to cope with entrepreneurship for people that have no background in the field? Uh, actually, it's all about uh, willpower. 
you don't have to have all the background in the field. You will not have any way. Because uh, in order for you to do entrepreneurship, it's business. Practically, you have to be HR, you have to be accounts, you have to be auditor, you have to be uh, project management, you have to be developer, you have to be everything. So you cannot be everything. So you are good at what, what you are doing, but uh, first of all, the first step is uh, the good thing about right now is that you have all the ecosystem to support you. So join those accelerator programs uh, and just, just I don't say like keep joining, that, but you have to allocate certain time, like 30% of your time to join all these programs. Uh, some of it may require a little bit of money, but take that as a learning journey. It's not about winning. Example, if you join Hackathon, it's not about winning. Then you don't win, then you lose altogether. No, you learn uh, along the way. If you join accelerator program, few weeks, few months, there's so many programs, you learn. They will teach you many modules. And at the same time, those modules are essentially like theoretical, but at least you have some platform with some understanding. But you also get to meet a lot of mentors. So your mentors are like seasoned players of, of, of uh, this startup. Some of them are very good in sales. They will teach you all about how to do sales, how to penetrate, how to talk to people. Some will uh, give you like how to do MVPs. So all these you, you gather all together and make your own recipe. And because if you want to wait until you have background or you have experience, that will take you like 40, 50 years old. That will not happen too late, right? So, uh, and in today's world, the beautiful part is that, um, although we have restaurant called Secret Recipe, but in today's world, there's no secret recipe already. Everybody is sharing recipe in YouTube. Everybody, there's no like, oh, this is my, my family recipe, no. No more. Everybody, the, 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 the culture today is like, if you have one good tip, you will tell the whole world. Okay, so, uh, so take this opportunity. You are born in the right time, in the right era, where everybody is sharing everything. And people really happy to push everybody uh, to be successful. So just jump into the ship. And I would like to also share, um, I've, I've met a few, uh, uh, I would say, not to say just students, lah, a fresh graduate or even before they graduated. They came to me and asked, like, hey, I know how to do this and this, how to do business, what to do first. So the fact that they come and ask, that alone tells me that they have the, the, the first quality to become entrepreneur. And because they are putting down, jotting down. Of course, uh, even though I tell so much, they will not grab 100%. They will keep coming back after three months, four months, keep coming back. Because we can understand, for youngsters, uh, potentially uh, from USM, you are good with technology. Potentially, you are already uh, capable of doing your own MVP. But what you don't see from your lens is the scalability and how the market will behave. And most importantly is how to manage a company. And manage a company is about compliance. No matter how good your business, your compliance is not there, even trader will not give you money. Right, trader? <laughs> so so uh, you will not get money from, from grants. You will not get money from investors. No matter how good you are. Right, so your so all this you cannot get the background right away. Our our education system works in such a way that uh, science student goes to science school, uh, business student goes to business school. You know, and uh, all this you don't talk to each other. There's no um, what they call this uh, uh assimilasi, assimilasi, no uh, trans uh, discipline come into one place. I don't like to subject entrepreneurship, which does nothing actually. So my point is, um, that the, the quick answer to that is, is it hard to cook? It is not hard. Don't put it as a word hard. It's interesting to cook. So when you put interesting, you feel every day you gain something and you can do it. So whatever you learn, you apply. Whatever you learn, you apply. So that's, that's a quick one for me. Just do it. If you want to do it, just do it. Mr. Jay Sean or Mr. Adrian, would you like to add to that? Mm, I think I need to just touch on what I previously mentioned also, like uh, one of the startups, Affidia, the founders has no background in space tech. They only have, uh, I think, electric. One is electrical and engineering, and the other one should be communication, something to do with social media, marketing side. 
So they had no background in space tech. Um, what they did was to actually do a lot of research. So you don't have to specifically have a specialty in that field to actually start the startup within that field. Because I would suggest just get your research done, validate it with people. Um, right now, like Lisa said, there's a lot of information, accessibility to information in the current era, the current generation right now is basically there. You can just get information on patterns, on everything. It's out there right now with internet. Um, uh, you have everything in your palm. It's how you execute it. I think execution for startups is a very crucial thing. You can have everything within your graphs, but the execution part is the, one of the toughest parts for startups, I think. Uh, from my background within the project management office on the Malaysian Startup Ecosystem Movement as well, they can have a lot of great ideas, a lot of great initiatives, but to run the execution takes a lot of focus. So like Lisa said, keep, keep, re uh, keep running, keep swimming. Uh, you have to be very, very focused. Um, believe in yourself if you are, if you've already started the journey, be focused. There will be a lot of noise. Uh, like Mr. Adrian said, there'll be a lot of whispers stakeholders and everything will come to you. Uh, but if you know what you're doing, make sure be very focused and continue. Uh, and there will be always, yeah, be focused, but also feedback is important. So never push aside feedback, but know what you're doing and where you're going to. So identify those two points. Where will you be going? What's your end journey and how you're going to get there? That's how from my side. All right. Thank you, Mr. Jay Sean. Mr. Adrian, would you like to add on or? Mm. So I started selling salmon when I had no idea where the fish came from, uh, no idea how e-commerce worked, and no idea how to manage a cold chain. Um, a cold chain is, is very serious in the sense that um, there's a lot of uh, food and health safety measures that you have to take into account. Um, and so, again, um, the answer is no, you don't have to have a background. You just have to start somewhere and you just have to be in the same vertical, uh, vertical as in the same line across the top and don't spray yourself too thin horizontally. And that's one of the mistakes that I did. I sprayed myself too thin, too fast, uh, focus on the, the horizon, uh, sorry, the, vert the vertical. So. Um, and then it's very easy to learn these days because there's, there's YouTube and there's, there's so many people to talk to and, and it's like, you know, if you want to do Salmon, just add everybody that does Salmon on LinkedIn, you know, or just go to Facebook and just add all the groups and then just start reading, right? Start reading, start finding out and then, and then you start talking to people and then people like, oh yeah, yeah. So then it's like, you, you, you're validating yourself. Uh, so, um, it's like, um, how do you say? Um, when you do it alone, uh, it's harder. When you do it in a lot of people, then it's much easier. La. Yeah. So uh, the answer for me in short is uh, no, you don't have to have a background in the field. Um, if, if you're rich enough and you're in a growth stage, then you just hire people that are smarter than you. La. Oops, the co hosts have gone. Shall we pick another question, guys? Uh, as a youth, or are we supposed to end at six o'clock? That's why everybody like turn off already. All go pasar Ramadan, is it? <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, I think the three likes is uh, yeah. I like this question, uh, Sean. Do, you, do looks play a role in starting entrepreneurship, like Mister J? Sean, I'm not sure whether they say you're handsome or you know you have to be a co-founder to be. Yeah, you want to address that? Uh, well, I was replying to that question actually uh, through the comments. Uh, for me, I, I would say no. Uh, but I think it's more how you carry yourself, how you network with people, how you talk to people, how you communicate with people. You have to bring that kind of uh, aura 
you know, when you actually go out and speak to people, you have to build your confidence. Uh, I would say confidence will will bring in the secret recipe to it to yourself. Because for me, I would say when I was a lot younger during my college days, uh, good looks. Okay, let me be very transparent. Like good looks will bring you to a certain level. And really? that's, it's, really? it's how you where actually you articulate. Where how you use articulate. your looks? I would like to know where you use your looks. <laughs> no, how sorry. You, <laughs> how you actually articulate after that. You know, how you actually speak to people. If you have looks, but you can't, you can't communicate with other people, that is going to be a setback for you. Because at the end of the day, you have to know how to get your message across as an individual. If you cannot get that message across, and you won't be, you will not be able to get people to listen to you, then there is no point of uh, going into entrepreneurship because your communication is your most vital key to actually bring that up. So looks only gives you a certain standard, I would say. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. J. Sean, for answering the question. Moving on, let's move to the next question. As a youth, one of the main challenges and supporters sometimes is peer pressure. That is that it is too early for me to start a business while in university and that I should just enjoy my youth. What's your take on this? Any one of you want to answer this question? I think the comments already answered it about the anonymous person. Very good. Uh, yeah, you should actually believe in yourself. You know where you are. I would say it's just it's never too early or never too late to start start up. There are startups that are founded by founders in their later years. There are some startups that are founded in during their high school years as well. So know what you want. If you are going to go into the ecosystem. There are a lot of uh, programs out there, there are a lot of mentors out there. Maybe you can validate uh, your idea with the people first. Don't, don't be succumbed to peer pressure. Uh, I would say, I don't know, I think a lot of pe people in age, we may live with certain regrets with our decision. So I would say if there's an opportunity out there, don't be afraid to grab it. Maybe you can balance it out. Uh, if you don't want to push all your time into going into entrepreneurship, starting something new, then divide it. Maybe during the weekends, you can slowly work on your ideas. And during the weekdays, you still have your youth to go and enjoy. So if you don't want to put in full force or you're not ready yet, then find a way to balance it out. It's always about balance. Huh? That's my two cents. All right. Thank you, Mr. J. Sean. Anyone would like to add on to that? Well, the, the anonymous answer was mine, so I've done my role already. <laughs> uh, Miss Lisa, do you want to add on to that? or? We can move on to the next question. Like this question. I feel like this question is like me me asking, like I put in the question. I feel it, that feeling, you know, when I was younger. I guess I, uh, yeah, entrepreneurship is not for everyone. That is something that we have to recognize. And how to know is your inner voice. If your inner voice is giving you that doubt, either you fight it, you fight or you just, you know, acknowledge that. So it's either telling you who you are or uh, it's telling you to take the, the challenge. So uh, what I shall say here is that uh, you can see so many uh, example out there, people like Tayo Ami, you know, people who are actually designed to be entrepreneurs, they cannot stay uh, being an employee because their mind is like that. You know, they want to achieve more. Their mind just like cannot stop thinking and always see opportunities. And 
so itchy to try, right? And there are people who just like, oh, I don't want that kind of problem. I just want to, you know, uh, go as a professional uh, engineer until I die. I have friends who tell me when when we were younger, not to say younger, like maybe middle thirties, we always sit side by side. Uh, we like, oh, I can die as engineer. We are just happy, you know. We have our paychecks, our our bonuses, and then we have our uh, traveling overseas for technology transfer. What else to ask for? We have good cars, good house, a well-behaved children. You know, if you want that kind of life, then entrepreneurship is really not for you, honestly. So, but there are people who really want challenges. Uh, there's very one good a uh, guy, uh, one a uh, startup, uh, started uh same time with me, uh, also in Penang. He's actually a national uh sports person, sports uh what do you call this um. Uh, Athlete, uh, uh. so from from that attribute itself, you can tell he don't settle for something low. You see, so he's already at that 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 thinking, and he has good look just to 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 add in. Okay, for his look, he can go go just anywhere. He can also he also have very good uh what for this communication skill to be employed uh, at any MNC in 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 Penang anytime, but. That is not him. He wants to go through startup life. Up until today, we are talking about uh, not enough money. <laughs> so, but my point is, uh, again, it's the attribute of yourself. How, what, what is your inner voice inside you telling you? If your inner voice is so strong to push forward, anything else beside you, I don't care already. And only think one thing: what to achieve, what to achieve, what to achieve. Tomorrow, what to do? Or oh, this one cannot do. Then, then we do this, we do this. So this is uh, how an uh, entrepreneur's mind works. So, you 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 don't care about your age already. You can be young, you can be old, but it's how you regulate your mind. I hope that helps. Thank you so much, Miss Lisa, for answering the question, and thank you to the other two panelists as well for answering the question. Mm -hmm. So I guess we shall end this Q and A session due to time time restraint, and then I will pass back the floor to MC. Thank you. Thank you to all respective panelists for addressing the question regarding the topic in a bigger picture. Your expertise has helped our participants in understanding today's discussion. We greatly appreciate your contribution for this discussion. We are elevated to have each of you to attend today's discussion. To commemorate today's session, we'd like to invite the neatly dressed participants to open their cameras for a group photo. You are given two minutes to fix up your outfits and ensure your camera is working before we take the picture. For the first page, three, two, one. For the second page, three, two, one. So that's all from me. I'll be passing back the stage to the MC. Ladies and gentlemen, in concluding today's discussion, we'd like to express our utmost appreciation and gratitude for actively participating in this discussion. A big round of applause and recognition to our panelists for their time. Rest assured that the knowledge share will be used for the competition. Thank you for making this section a success and we look forward to seeing you soon. Keep your eyes open as the competition is near. Until next time, keep up with our social media for future updates. Thank you and we and we wish you all the best.